Chris, um, good to talk. And I think one of the questions I wanted to start with was, do you feel that the scholarship of the history of Australia in world affairs is, compared to some other areas of historical interest, somewhat impoverished by lack of diversity? Yes, thanks for that, David. I think it is interesting that in you know the recent decade or so, the the vibrancy perhaps has gone out of the study of the history of Australian foreign policy and defence policy. Uh, as you say, a lack of diversity perhaps in view. Certainly when we think back to the Vietnam War period uh, and its aftermath, when you had the competition between contest of ideas between revisionists um, in the United States, for example, but in other parts of the world as well, their view on American policy in the Cold War, as opposed to the more orthodox view um, of the Cold War. There was a vibrancy of debate that, that I think reached into Australia as well. Um, it was obviously, a, uh, these were um, topics and, um, of great interest given the Vietnam War generations, uh, the baby boom generations interest in, in those events as well. So I think in the 70s and 80s, into the 90s perhaps we had that. We also perhaps had a flowering of you know, empirical studies based on the archives into the Cold War history, early Cold War history, your work and my work among Wayne Reynolds and David McLean and, and Peter Edwards and many others, and Rick Pemberton, etc. It just seems in recent times we don't have quite the same interest. And, um... and do you think related to that, I mean, you spoke of an energy of revisionism around involvement in the Vietnam War, and that of course was associated with um, the ideology of the Labour Party too, um, which was part of that revisionism. Is, is the um, unhinging of party politics with recent historical writing part of the problem? Look, that, that's a very good point, and it, it probably is in a way in that at least, uh, you know, the two major parties, the Labour and Liberal, the Coalition, Labour and Coalition parties, have um, a general agreement on things such as the, the United States alliance. Um, there isn't the same debate, certainly, on the left within the Labour Party as there used to be. You think of, you know, a recent publication like James Carr, an excellent book on the Whitlam era, and you would have thought that might have generated a whole lot of debate within the Labour Party, but it didn't. And, you know, you think back to Julia Gillard's famous um, speech to Congress, I think it was, where she was almost going more than Harold Holt all the way. So I think you were tapped into something there, that in terms of um, mainstream politics, of course the Greens probably sit a bit differently from that, but in terms of mainstream politics and then more broadly in the community too, there's a more consensus position around the American alliance and its usefulness um, that I think um, probably does underpin the, the quiet lack of debate anyway in, on, on foreign policy. I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to stretch my mind to thinking about what um, was retained of that energy of revisionism that lasted beyond the issue of the Vietnam War. Now one of the issues was of course the nuclear issue. But even that seems to have receded as a kind of animating force for the left more generally, as a great cause. Um, and I don't think we've seen its replacement by anything like a, an environmentalist um, sensibility, you know, tapping into a, a broader concept of Australian world affairs yet, have we? Would I be right? No, I think that's right. And I think perhaps for younger historians coming through and people choosing to do postgraduate degrees, etc., there has been more a focus on areas such as Indigenous history, um, uh, for want of a better word, identity politics in, in um, uh, some um, women's history issues to do there. That's where there's been more of a vibrancy and a debate, I think. And um, But it does, and I, I guess there is a dominance of the established view within Australian foreign policy there, as, as you suggest. I mean, it may, you know, the big issue that, um, that Australia may face over the next 25 years, which may lead historians to reflect back a bit more will be the relationship between the United States and China and ideas of containment of China and Obama's pivot to Asia and all those things, which may re reawaken interest in the early Cold War period. It may reawaken interest in the Vietnam period because it relates both geographically and regionally, but also the issues are similar. So that may awaken the interest of younger scholars. But that area at the moment seems more 
dominated by international relations specialists than international mm. historians, I think it's fair to say. And it's interesting you mention perhaps a resurgence of interest in earlier periods of the Cold War. I've noticed a bit of an upswing in the number of times the Cold War is invoked in pieces of historical writing that aren't ostensibly about international relations. It's, it's, it's becoming a trope or a framing device which not always used with great explanatory effect to my mind, some of the things I've seen, but nevertheless its, um, it's emergence um, as a kind of framing device does seem to be a bit of a trend. That's, that's one thing. The other thing I wonder about, Chris, is um, that if, if we're talking about things that haven't happened, that's often partly because of things that have. And, you know, if you and I think about where some of the biggest arguments, debates have happened about the history of Australia and world affairs, we've got hung up for a little while um, on notions of independence, um, first from the, the left kind of thwarted nationalism side of things, and then more recently from the um, school of thought championed by Neville Maney and others about, you know, Australia's greatest form of um, patriotism, of, um, of nationalism rather, has been Britishness, um, that argument. And to some extent, that has absorbed energy, mm. hasn't it? Oh, I agree. I think that's been one of the areas of Australian international history that's um, been the most interesting, as you suggest, has been the most hotly debated in recent times, is British imperialism in Australia, the, you know, the empire in Australia, um, the decolonisation or the de-dominionisation of Australia. So there has been a lot of um, energy and very good research done in those in those areas in understanding decolonisation. I think that stretches in, in some of the um, work we're doing here, stretches on into some of the work we're doing here in Deakin in terms of the decolonisation of the South Pacific, which um, uh, which we've been working on here with Deakin, and whether it's Papua New Guinea or Vanuatu or gen more generally Melanesia, the South Pacific, that there has been this understandable engagement and interest in the end of empire, the whole decolonisation era, and and looking at those two, the, you know, the Cold War is one paradigm, and the decolonisation of the European empires is another paradigm of 20th century world history. And you're absolutely right. I think there's been um, a lot of focus on the decolonisation in recent, and that's where a lot of the energy and the debate has has gone. And getting back to your earlier comment about our discussions on um, relating to Vietnam and so on is part of the energy around the South Pacific catching up with archival releases because this is a later phase of decolonisation. So is it partly driven by archival releases and the opportunities for us to see government documents or are there other factors as well? Mm -hmm. Look, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. And it's the other side of it is that it's the end of a, you know, this long story, this huge epoch in world history, which you know goes right back to the origins of the European empires, you know, in the 15th, 16th centuries, and ends in the 20th century, and the Pacific, Australia's local region, is where that finished. And of course, Australia was a major player with its own empire and colonies with Papua New Guinea and Nauru. And I think, at least subliminally, that the interest is there because of all the contemporary interests about on refugee issues mm. and other issues to do with Papua New Guinea and Australia's relationship with that. And Pacific the other, Solution. Pacific Solution, Ramsey and the Solomons a few years ago. So there's certainly been, um, you know, that sparked, I think, interest in understanding, well, how did we get here in terms of South Pacific Island nations and what was Australia's role? So I think that's right. And, um, you know, I, I think, though, again, it's, it is interesting that in the huge dimension that perhaps haven't been explored in Australian international history is uh, the economic dimension. That I mean, that David Lee and others have done work on foreign economic policy, but it, there hasn't been a study, you know, similar to perhaps in again take up the revisionists' approach and perspective, if not their actual arguments, about exploring, you know, Australia's place in the global economy and how that might have changed, and Australia's perhaps economic dominance of the South Pacific and its leading role in Papua New Guinea economically and in other ways. Um, you know, that, 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 that perhaps that's an area that um, uh, Australian international historians haven't ventured into as much as we should have or could have. It's a good point because um, um, where we are familiar with stories, 
around exploitation, because that let, let's face it, that's a word that you should be using when you're talking about economic history, um, in a, mm. not necessarily in a pejorative way, mm. um, but when we are familiar with stories of Australia and the South Pacific in, in ways that relate to exploitation, it tends to go mostly to the older notions of you know blackbirding and, and so on. But um, the more recent um, activities around mining, in particular uses of labour, they're, they're reasonably muted in mainstream stories of Australia and the world, aren't they? Yes, I think that's right. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, the whole, I guess, history of Australia's place in international finance or, or the fin- international financial system. I think, you know, the, the sort of work that from very different perspectives people like Hobsbawm and Niall Ferguson have done, Eric Hobsbawm and Niall Ferguson, you know, from the UK, have, we haven't had the equivalent in, in Australia. Um, and understandably, perhaps, because we've got a smaller profession, um, that, that we don't get as big a diversity. But there, there are some big areas here that, um, that we haven't explored. And it, I think it is interesting to think about whether there are structural reasons why that has happened or whether this is in part intellectual fashions. I'm not sure. Mm, and, and presumably the, the demise, let's face it, there has been a demise of economic history, um, economic historians um, amongst us, that must be a contributing factor to this. Um, but you're right. I wonder whether it's is it, is it partly saved by the growth of the um, fascination with the international or indeed transnational, whereby um, historians have become more enamoured of conferences and gatherings and ways in which um, peoples from the South Pacific mix with both Australians and um, other peoples from other parts of the world in ways that might advance their own interests and rights. Is that partly a corrective, do you think? Oh, look, I think so, and I wouldn't want to exaggerate this lack of. I had to think back to that very successful um, symposium on Australia in the League of Nations that was held in Melbourne last year where you chaired a session and there were many interesting papers there on the 1920s and 30s in Australia and that brought in the themes of imperialism, internationalism that, that you're mentioning. And so, so and you know, um, other people such as George Amusi have been looking at migration and, as you say, many um, Australian-focused historians, if I can use that term, have turned more outwards to look at Australia within those global movements and, you know, Marilyn Lake and, and Henry Reynolds and, and it, with issues of race and putting it in the national con- As you say, transnationalism has become, um, you know, the new context, intellectual context. So it's interesting, though, for international historians of long standing, who've done this for a long time, is that their claim for um, originality, I think, is over, overblown and overstated. And, and in some ways, they're returning to old mythologies and old traditions where there's nothing that's terrific that's but you're right maybe that's a very good way of seeing the new energy in Australian international history is through the transnationalist lens uh, I think partly but but one of the things that tr- also troubles me a little bit about the phenomenon that you've been summarizing in the, the transnational turn if you like so well is that it doesn't seem to invite of contest we started talking just a few minutes ago about the lack of contest and contestation um, it seems to this this the transnational push to my mind um, invites a kind of a way of viewing and a sensitivity to new ways of viewing and, and, and indeed some very interesting and new archival sources too, which don't necessarily invite a, a great contest in terms of in, in interpretive frameworks brought to bear. Would I be right in that? No, look, I think that's that's fair. I think I think that's fair, and 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 part of that I think perhaps arises because. And I guess this is in part throwing the baby out with the bathwater, is that, you know, there's almost a need to deny the nation state in this process. So you're looking at non-state actors, you're looking at the interaction between individuals and non-state organisations, etc., non-government organisations. Um, so, you, you know, in that sense, the leap forward has been to deny the centre and the state. But, of course, I think what your point impinges on is there's always a contest over the nation state, who controls it. And you say in Australia, you know, in Australian international history, there have been all those debates about, you know, were these other people's wars? How, you know, has Australia never been independent in its foreign? Has it always chosen to follow 
the great ally, its great and powerful friends. So there's been all those, and many others, many of those debates, and they relate around the nation state, state institute, you know, departments of foreign affairs and trade, departments of defence, the military, all these things. What are the dominant ideas there? What, who, who's in control, left or right, etc. You're, so you're right, I think, in the, uh, that there is, um, by looking at non-state actors, you can tend not to look at that huge contest that goes on. And, and then, of course, it is often a, um, a brutal contest in the, for the centre. Um, and, and this is something, as I say, if you look back at the Vietnam War period or, again, when you look back to the appeasement era that I've written about, of course, there are great contests and alternatives being publicly debated, which are then later picked up by historians. And this might bring us back to that, the sense of, you know, the lack of contest about some of the major international issues that it means that, that, that this isn't grabbing the attention of historians and younger people who are planning to be historians. Uh, and indeed, perhaps, uh, just to extend that line of thinking, perhaps it's also why it doesn't resonate, um, the nexus between mainstream historical writing and party politics doesn't resonate quite like it perhaps once did as well. And, and the other thing that comes into play here has been, you know, the debate's almost taken a, one step apart. There's been the huge debate over ANZAC and there's also been the debate over, you know, Keating versus Howard, over um, Kokoda versus Gallipoli. Um, and in some ways, the debate over international history has been translated into the place of the Anzac legend in Australia and that's and, and it's almost takes it one one step removed you know there's these questions about Australia, independence of foreign policy you know relationship with great and powerful friends decolonisation you know we have these very heated debates over the meaning of Anzac and Australia's military history so probably part you know I'm thinking here of the honest history group in um, yes. Canberra and elsewhere that part of the energy has gone into those sort of debates, which don't on the surface seem immediately about the international history debates. We've been talking about the Cold War or the, after the Cold War or, or even appeasement, etc. But I think they are related to that. I think you're right. I think they, they soak up what energy there is for historical inquiry and debate. Um, it, it's probably not too big an exaggeration to say that ANZAC has appropriated some of the energy and some of the lines mm. of debate that... Um, we had hoped might flourish in other ways. I, I know this is going maybe sounding.